and um, you know, perfect thing to keep in, in mind. And you know what, here's, here's the problem. I find that we do not, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that we sing very often anymore of the second coming of Christ, about his soon coming. We don't sing that very much anymore. Part of the reason is because of what we're going to look at tonight. Since there is no understanding of the difference between the two kingdoms, then what happens is that uh, people get in their mind the idea that Christ can't come back until we have gone through and done certain things, and, uh, you know, the gospel has to go to the ends of the earth, and so he's, you know, there's no chance of him coming right now because we're so far away from getting this job done, we got to just... And so our, our false view of the kingdoms leads into a false missiology, a false perspective on missions, and then we don't end up singing about the soon return of Christ, and that he could come back, and he could come back today, and, and, and so we need to be working for him now, and uh, you know, so we just lose a lot there. So, so tonight is a, maybe the most exciting section of our discipleship too. And we will start it this evening, and then next Wednesday night, we will be live streaming the Discipleship Conference from Atlanta. And so the following Wednesday night, uh, that will be uh, 24th, I think it is, we will have, uh, we will finish up what we're starting tonight on looking at the two kingdoms, I guess on the 25th. So, uh, so let's start off with an introduction about this topic terms of how to study the Bible, why is it important uh, to make this distinction between God's two kingdoms? Now, a lot of times when you see the phrase two kingdoms, what they will lead you to believe you should be thinking of is God's kingdom versus Satan. Well, Satan's, okay, count that as a third then, because that's not what I'm talking about. I will say that there are three C's to Christianity, three C's to complete Christianity, Congregation, commission, and compassion. So if you want to be a complete subject in the kingdom, really it is a trinity of three C's. Congregation, the spiritual kingdom. Uh, commission, evangelism and discipleship. And compassion, encompassing our community involvement. And I think on the slide I've thrown, thrown, some old, uh, thrown down some old school terms next to these. So... Church for congregation, cross for commission, and Christ, Christ likeness for compassion. So you were created to be creative in fulfilling Christ's commission through our community of saints into the community of the lost. And that is the extraordinary work that Jesus wants to release in your life. And it is also rooted in this discussion we're going to start looking at tonight of his kingdom. So the kingdom, uh, kingdom call is really the charge that urges us forward with truth and with faith. It is the mission that drives our ministries. It is the mandate that moves us because God has more in store. And the teaching about the kingdom is the truth that God wants us to use to recapture our childlike ability to be creative in completing the mission of Christ's Great Commission. So let's uh, introduce and see the theme that this is Roman numeral two, the theme of the Bible is the kingdom. So we're going to work through this together. Uh, I feel like I don't have as much light up here as I usually do. I don't know, but i uh, just, just mention that in the case that uh, in a, there's a switch back there to throw. Letter A, the issue is a throne. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. And so you should find these references, verse ref, the reference on your handout, you'll have to turn in your own Bible to look up the verse, and uh, as usual, if you want to keep up, you kind of need to be going over to the next one before, uh, you know, even, even uh, before we get there, as it were, after, as soon as we're finished with this one. So Isaiah 14, verse 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the na nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
That's where it all started. Letter B, the Bible ends with kings reigning on thrones. This is Revelation chapter 22, uh, verses 1 to 5. And he showed me a river of, of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So there is kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But, notice in verse 3, the throne of God and of the Lamb. Again, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and they shall be, um, there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So, let us see the issue in history, and in the Bible, is dominion by domination. Issue throughout all history is really kingdoms. You know, who's going to have the kingdom? And it doesn't matter whether you are, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin, and you decide that you now want to be uh, czar for eternity, uh, or whomever. The, the issue is always kingdoms. And so letter D, the main subject of the Bible, is really a story about a king and his kingdom. So whatever else transpires... Uh, it is only part of that overall plan. So, so, number one, redemption of humanity becomes a way to garner subjects for that kingdom. And secondly, regeneration of the universe becomes the way to restore those subjects in the spatial sphere of that kingdom. So in order to have a kingdom, you have to have subjects, you have to have land. Uh, so, the, you know, the theme of the Bible really is the kingdom Redemption fits into that as a way to get subjects. What Jesus called the regeneration, meaning of nature, of the earth, of the universe, uh, fits into that by way of having the land for the subjects to live on. So letter E, this is God's plan for the universe. And you need to remember, uh, you know, that rule of Bible study that as we went through those rules of Bible study, one of the ones that we looked at was this. God has really a trinity of three plans because God has a plan for the universe. God has a plan for this planet and God has a plan for you. So that's three plans. And, and God's plan is the establishment of his twofold kingdom against the counterfeit kingdoms of Satan and its usurper king, the devil. Letter F, so in order to understand the Bible and God's plan for your life, you have to have a basic concept of his plan for the universe and his plan for this planet. Without it, you are frustrated. Well, let me show you what I mean. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, Paul says plainly, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now let me just say, I just gave you the answer. Uh, in that one verse I just cured, now if you will, I, you may not take the medicine, but I just gave you the cure for your bipolar and your PTSD and all your anxiety and all these other things. Why is it the cure? Because you know what? You may even have hope in Christ. You may even be saved. A lot of saved people, uh, you know, deal with a lot of trauma and then can't seem to let go of it and get over it. And it's because if it's only in this life, if you never look beyond this life, well, then you're going to be miserable. That's exactly what Paul says. So the key and the cure is that you've got to look beyond to the invisible, to what God and you are doing in eternity in order to read that back in and make any sense at all of this life. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 
Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right now we don't see him as he is. I mean, we have a certain idea of how he was because we've got the four Gospels and we can read about how he was. We don't really have any concept of how he is. And even what is told to us in the book of Revelation is of how he is, it's, it's kind of you know, like, wow, it's, I don't know if I can even believe that. I mean, what does that even look like? And, but we will see him as he is then. And therefore, we'll look just like him. And every man, it says in verse 3, that hath this hope in him, purifieth himself. Means you get out of your life those things you ought to be letting go of because they're just poisoning you. So, I mean, this, this whole talk about the two kingdoms is really your therapy session for the week. You can cancel your appointment now. You don't have to pay that money. Whatever it is you pay for, you know, $90 for 50 minutes, I don't know, whatever it may be. This is your therapy session because you can get out of your life all that trash if you follow along on what we're going to say about the kingdoms because you're going to purify yourself then even as Christ is pure. If you have this hope in you, if you keep your eye on the prize, if you are looking forward, looking beyond, seeing the invisible, Ephesians 1, Verses 15 and to 23 say, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, and that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. He has called you to something. Understanding that is what will replace your depression with hope and replace your despair and the darkness with hope. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality. I don't, know, I don't know what's against you. I don't know what was done to you. I don't know how you felt about it. I don't know. I don't know all that. But I do know that this hope, this calling, this thing, this hope of your calling, the thing that you are called to should give you such hope because it is far above even all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So the kingdom, just like our salvation, has three tenses. So regarding our salvation on the cross, we have been justified, past tense, by the Spirit. We are being sanctified, present tense, and one day we will be glorified, oh, that it were today. The kingdom is also three-dimensional. First letter A, the kingdom of heaven has a past territorial dimension based on the terms of God's covenant with David. Second letter B, the kingdom of God has a present abstract spiritual dimension because Christ inaugurated new covenant salvation of Gentiles in order to make his people, the Jews, jealous. I mean, that was just part of the eternal purpose of God. And that's, that's, where, we step, that's where we step in. Romans 10, verse 19 Paul says, but I say, did not Israel know? For Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, that are no people to me. They're not my people, I'll, but I'll use them to provoke you to jealousy, jealousy, and by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Romans 11, verse 11, I say then, have they, the Jews, Israel today, the Zionists, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. 
but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. Why? For to provoke them to jealousy. So they will be jealous that we have received the new covenant blessings which were promised to Judah and Israel. But we get them by faith. We get them by grace and, and through faith. And, you know, that ought to make them jealous and desire to come back to God and receive their Messiah. So there is a sense in which we are translated into the kingdom of Christ right now because the Spirit has already come. Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So let her see the kingdom of heaven has a future concrete and material dimension because Christ brings it in at his second coming. So there is this sense in which the kingdom has not yet come and will not arrive until Jesus' own return. So the kingdom of God, it's here, it's with us, it's in us. The kingdom of heaven, well, it's, it's not yet. Matthew 26, 29, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, Jesus says, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. John the Baptist had the same concept of the kingdom as the Old Testament prophets did. In other words, the, the understanding that the kingdom included salvation plus judgment, or judgment that brings in salvation. And naturally, the, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God were fused together at the first and, and second coming, so that first and second dimension are fused together at the first coming of Christ because the church age in between was hidden as a mystery and not revealed until Paul. Hence, uh, you know, when Jesus comes, he says the kingdom is at hand and it was a physical offer of the kingdom of heaven, but it, it also included a strong spiritual element of the kingdom of God, because Jesus is king of both. And so Matthew 3, verse 6, and they were baptized of him in there, there, and, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. I mean, John has just said, you need to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yet it has this element, confess your sins. Matthew 3.11, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now he'll baptize you with fire. That's kind of a kingdom of heaven thing. But he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's, that's like a kingdom of God thing. So letter D, preaching the good news or the gospel of the kingdom. Um, meant announcing the good news that the return of the Davidic kingdom was finally at hand. So Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Proof, proof of that, proof that it was at hand. He was healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. That was the proof. Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages te teaching their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. M Matthew 10, verse 7, when he sends out his apostles, his 12 apostles, his 12 missionaries on his behalf, he says, as ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand means be preparing for it. What else does at hand mean? Well, at hand meant the kingdom was being offered in the person of the king. So he could be rejected as he was in Matthew 13. At hand meant the kingdom existed wherever Jesus himself went because all things were subject to him. Matthew 12, verse 28, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. At hand meant the hour of decision to submit and join this kingdom has already arrived. It meant you're not automatically a subject to this kingdom just because you were born physically a child of Abraham. 
You need to repent, confessing your sins, a baptism of repentance, to be ready for the coming of the king and his kingdom. So today it means that kingdom is present spiritually to all who submit, and it is approaching physically whenever Christ returns. The foreshadowing of Christ's coming kingdom Talked about in Matthew 16, verses 27 and 28. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now this is speaking kingdom of heaven. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So the foreshadowing of that kingdom was his transfiguration. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 3, because that is when three of those who were standing there, Peter, James, and John, did not die before they saw him coming in his kingdom, Matthew 17, 1, after six days, like, like six dispensations, like 6,000 years. Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth him up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light, the light... <clears throat> and behold, there appeared unto, Mo unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. So at hand also means this is inevitable. Matthew 26, verses 46 and 47, rise, let us be going. Behold, he, it is, at, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet speak, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came. And with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And uh, yet, it's still going to come. So, uh, so the one who was going to betray him was at hand. Meaning, okay, they're right here and they're going to show up any second. So that phrase at hand means that likewise with the kingdom, it is inevitable in its coming. And in all these cases we just listed, the proofs that follow John, Jesus, and the apostles' claim of a legitimate offer of the kingdom, the proofs that follow are the miraculous signs of healing, casting out demons by Christ, by the apostles, and then as the king is rejected and events unfold in the course of the Bible's progressive revelation, God adds into it. After, after Jesus is done and can't speak to them directly, he adds speaking in tongues through the apostles. Because they are his missionaries, his representatives, so they speak in tongues as, as proof and as witness. And then as Revelation progressive, all of that dies out because now the kingdom of heaven goes into mystery form. The kingdom of of God is, is what is left on this planet. So Roman numeral four, Jesus makes clear that the salvation aspect of the kingdom will be accomplished at his first coming, but the judgment aspect will be suspended until his second advent. Letter, uh, you know, so we would say this, letter A, between the, the mystery that lay between, in between those two comings, first coming and second coming, the mystery that was hidden there was the opening up of the spiritual aspect of kingdom blessings to the Gentiles by faith in Jesus Christ, even and only without works of the law. Uh, secondly, it was the revelation that the inclusion of Gentiles was not a last-minute adjustment to God's plan. It was not a last-minute accommodation. Actually, it was something predestined before the foundation of the world. Uh, 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 Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. God had planned this all along. That we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Why is that important? Because we are not Jews. If we're going to get their blessings, we've got to be adopted. And we are predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. He can adopt who he wants. And uh, so not only was it something predestinated before the foundation of the world, it was part of his eternal purpose all along. So, so three things, the eternal purpose of God is to glorify himself. So this is all out of Ephesians 3. 
It is to glorify himself, verse 21, unto God be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. So secondly, to do it through his son Jesus, verse, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, and, and, and number three, to do it through Christ's body, the church, verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Ephesians 1.11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So terms like that predestination are not, you know, Calvinist terms that refer to people who may be excluded from the offer of salvation. It's not, it's not talking about that. It all has to do with these two kingdoms. And so Roman numeral five, we don't fight to bring in the kingdom. At least not in the absolute concrete sense, because only Christ does that at his return. Instead, we don't fight, we fish. We fish and bring men and women as subjects of the king as voluntary subjects to him, so the kingdom is coming. And until we, uh, until then, until Christ brings it back and it gets here, we are to get people coming into the kingdom. Since the kingdom's coming, then our task is to get people coming into the kingdom. Acts 14, verse 22. Here's what Paul did whenever he went back and visited a second time the churches that he had planted and started and went back to encourage and strengthen those disciples. Here's what he told them in Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. One of the contributing factors to the kingdomization of the modern evangelical church is breaking down this distinction between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. So during the last 20 years, uh, even dispensational leaders have forsaken the distinction between the kingdom of heaven as seen in Matthew's gospel and they've made it increasingly synonymous with the kingdom of God as if there were no differences. Now, why is this so important? Because when the kingdom of heaven is no longer considered to be strictly Israel's coming messianic kingdom, then there is a loss of the scriptural division between earthly Israel and heavenly church, which is why, particularly in Reformed theology, you they have the church replacing Israel and taking all of her promises. And so there's that loss of distinction. Grace is then made partaker of the law. The church is then wrongly tasked with bringing in the kingdom by saying that its gospel signs and wonders have to be taken to the ends of the earth now. And until that's done, Christ can't come. And that's what they say. And that unsound doctrine is especially apparent in YWAM and other missions teaching like the Perspectives course. Uh, because this is a, since this is a doctrine of demons, it is subject to much demonic support by way of false prophecies and lying miracles. And people latch on to that as proof that, see, this must be right. So Christ is not waiting on us before he can come back. I'm just saying. It is not our job to bring in the kingdom. It is our job to fulfill the mission of the Great Commission and make disciples subjects of the king, which is kingdom work, because we are making them his subjects. We've given you a short, select bibliography of uh, other books that you can look at that kind of break out, also continue to break out that idea of kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God. It's, the reason it's so short 
is because nobody believes it anymore. And uh, even uh, almost all dispensationalists, normative, what, what they call normative dispensationalists, and certainly progressive dispensationalists, uh, deny that there's really any distinction between kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. But let's do, let's do our homework. Let's do our word work. Let's do our Bible work. And let's see if that's the case. So let's, let's talk about the two kingdoms. Uh, Roman numeral one, there are two distinctly different kingdoms in the Bible. And first letter A, the kingdom of God is spiritual. Romans 14, verse 7, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Well, Israel's kingdom, kingdom of heaven certainly was. Kingdom of God is not, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, but wait, when Jesus comes back, at the end of the tribulation, he's going to do a judgment, a sheep-goat judgment of the nations. And, and some of the nations do. If some flesh and blood does inherit the kingdom of heaven. Uh, okay, John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Uh, you know, which makes no sense at all for him to admit, well, I know you're come from God, but I'm kind of going to go stealth mode and come in here after dark. Uh, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Now, that's amazing. Uh, John, being the last gospel written, is including all the stuff that we really need in the dispensation of the grace of God, in the dispensation of which we now live. He includes all the things left out of some of the other gospels uh, because he knows that the door's already been shut, temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed, uh, that, that door on the kingdom of heaven is closed. So I need to go back through and I need to give in my gospel those things where Jesus talked about this other aspect of his kingdom. And verse 4, Nicodemus said and saith unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee. So that's like, you know, when Jesus says, verily, verily, that, yeah, okay, this is like, you need to pay attention to this, this is true. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. O oh, you son of Abraham, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say, said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit of God. You need to see the invisible. You need to look at the unseen. 1 Corinthians 4.20, For the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. Because you're born of the Spirit. Uh, now a kingdom has to have two things. It has to have a king and subjects. So first, the king is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, the subjects are spiritual beings, the sons of God made in his image. Okay, so you got son of God, king, sons of God, subjects. Uh, secondly, these two kingdoms are not the same. Uh, the kingdom of God is universal, and it includes angels and saints of all age ages. Well, that's not the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is entered only by the new birth, not true of the kingdom of heaven. I mean, some nations enter that just because they... Uh, they showed favor to God, God's Jesus' brethren, the Jews, during the tribulation. The kingdom of God is inward and spiritual, Luke 17, 21. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God's within you. Oh. The kingdom of God merges into the kingdom of heaven whenever Christ puts all things under his feet. And if this verse reference is not there, you ought to add in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 and 25. So, that's the kingdom of God. 
spiritual. The kingdom of heaven is literal. Now, the phrase kingdom of God occurs 70 times in 69 verses, all in the New Testament. The phrase kingdom of heaven is used 33 times in 32 verses. Every occurrence is in the book of Matthew, the gospel of the Jewish king. The book of Matthew, more than any other gospel, was written to Jewish people. It presented Jesus as their Messiah in the line of David. I mean, just check out his genealogy, Matthew's genealogy. So the kingdom of heaven is literal. Well, first off, heaven itself is a literal place because God created it. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So it's literal. So confusing the two kingdoms messes up the very first verse in the Bible. Because clearly, kingdom of God is not literal. It's not, it is in within you. You can't say, look here or there. But either, either the earth's not literal or, or heaven's not. I mean, you know, if the earth's not, if heaven's not, the earth's not. And if the earth is, then heaven has to be. And so kingdom of heaven itself, the heaven itself's a literal place. Secondly, the the king is the son of man, the king of the Jews, Jesus the Messiah. Talked about in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And it says at the, the end of that verse, his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper. Isaiah 9, verse, verses 6 and 7, particularly verse 7, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. Luke 1, 31 to 33, uh, especially verse, uh, verse 32 and 33, the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And thirdly, the subjects are literal flesh and blood human beings. So, We've given you a little uh, thing on your outline there, uh, kind of uh, breakdown of some distinctions. Kingdom of God, the ultimate aspect is it is the sovereign rule of God over all creation, over all the universe. Kingdom of God, rule of God over all the earth. Kingdom of heaven, rule of heaven over the nation of Israel and the nations. So ultimate aspect, sovereign rule of God over all creation. Spiritual aspect, kingdom of God, rule of God in the hearts and lives of his people. And then you got the kingdom of heaven, historical aspect, rule of God over the nation of Israel. Messianic aspect, rule of God over the nations of the earth during the millennium. So the kingdom has seen three phases since God allowed its destruction in the Old Testament and it's the dispersion of its subjects, the Jews, into Gentile nations. Phase one, okay, so since, since the destruction and dispersion, three phases. First phase, at hand. It was offered to Israel starting in the days of John the Baptist. Second phase, in mystery form, after they rejected King Jesus. That started in Matthew 13. And I'll say, you know, probably goes all the way through to, let's say, Revelation 19, because in Revelation 20 is phase three, the prophecy of the coming millennial aspect in Revelation chapter 20, of the thousand-year reign of Christ. But so there are three future phases for kingdom of heaven. Uh, there are, let us see, parallel uses of kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God in the Gospels. And because of that, some of today's scholars who apparently do not do their homework very well, uh, they say these two kingdoms are synonymous and they don't make any distinction between the two. And the thing they overlook is that the king of both kingdoms was present and therefore he was simply offering the kingdom without distinction. And sometimes it's in Matthew it might be called kingdom of heaven. And in the same, in a parallel account in Luke, it's called the kingdom of God. 
Now, that doesn't mean that both kingdoms are the same. Uh, it simply means that synonymous use is justified if the king is present making the offer. And it was a complete offer that would have fulfilled both the old covenant described by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy and the new covenant made with Israel described by Ezekiel and, uh, and Jeremiah. If they had received Jesus, they would have gotten both of those things at that same time. So in gospel passages describing identical events, uh, which kingdom does Jesus mean? Well, you know, since not every word of every discussion was recorded by every evangelist, he probably used both terms interchangeably during his teaching. Matthew focuses us on the literal kingdom of heaven aspect, using that phrase 32 times because of the purpose of his gospel. None of the other gospel writers use that phrase. Matthew and John were the only ear witnesses to Jesus' teaching, whereas both Luke and Mark were reporting what they had heard from others and the emphasis that their sources gave them. We know that the end result gives us all the nuances God wants us to consider. Letter D, let's clarify some kingdom contrasts. The kingdom of heaven is earthly, Matthew 8, 11, I say unto you that many shall come from east, the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's, that's hardly the same type of kingdom that's in your heart. So kingdom of heaven's earthly, kingdom of God is as wide as the universe, Luke 6, 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven is entered by a righteousness exceeding that of the scribes and Pharisees. Matthew 5, 20, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. That was simply the rules of the game. That's what it means when it says when Jesus comes back, he judges them, them according to their works. He rewards us according to our works, but he judges them according to their works. And so also the kingdom of God is entered by the new birth. John 3, verse 3 and, and verse 5, which we already read. Kingdom of heaven answers the hope of Israel and the Gentiles. Well, the kingdom of God answers the eternal, all-inclusive purpose of God. Matthew 5, verse 20 declares the condition on which a Jew could hope to enter the kingdom of heaven. His, his, righteousness, he had, his righteousness had to go beyond what the scribes and Pharisees were doing. Now, that doesn't mean they had to be even more meticulous. What Jesus is saying is they've gotten off track by the... Um, by the they, have they, have, they have strained at a gnat and swallowed the camel. Uh, so the only one who's going to get into my kingdom is the one who stops the camel. Forget about the gnats. Who cares about them? Um, and, and so Matthew 8, 12, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Huh. Um, Matthew 24, verses 50 and 51, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Huh. Matthew 25, verses 28 to 30, take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, none of those truths apply to the kingdom of God. That is only kingdom of heaven truth. Doctrinally, you can't apply it to us. Although cult teachers try and do that all the time. So the appearance of the word kingdom and the word disciple in the same verse occurs twice in Matthew and Mark, once in Luke and once in the, in the book of Acts because the king craves subjects. Are you one of them? The goal of discipleship is to make kingdom subjects. 
So the crucial question in this section tonight is this, are you ready for the king's dominion? Because if it was, if it was at hand in the gospels and the rapture is imminent and could take place any mo moment, it's much more at hand now. So uh, if so, if you, if you are ready for his dominion, then are you ready to study the Bible by tracing God's two kingdoms? Let's first trace the spiritual kingdom of God through the Bible. Uh, letter A, the kingdom of God was originally commissioned to Lucifer. Uh, Ezekiel 28, verses 13 and 14, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Now, that's not talking about Eden, the garden in Genesis. This is this being, what's being described here predates that. God did plant another garden eastward in Eden after the event, certain events kind of described here take place. But thou wast in, hast been in the garden, Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So you were the prime being reflecting and refracting the light of God and also singing about it. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. What happened? Well, an additional law of Bible study uh, is the law of interruption before completion. And this means that sometimes a gap of time hides within a single verse. Poor ejemplo, Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son of, is given, first coming, colon. And that colon separates 2,000 years because the verse goes on to say, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's the second coming. 2,000 years are hidden in that colon. Acts 6, uh, Isaiah 61, verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, first coming, comma. And that comma separates 2,000 years. Because then it goes on to say, and the day of the vengeance of our God. That's his second coming. So, so between the first coming, second coming, we're, we're saying 2,000 years. Because I want him to come back today. And... And so that comma separates 2,000 years. Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. That's at the end of the tribulation. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, that's Revelation 20 at the end of the millennium. So here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, a comma separates 1,000 years. Luke 2, verse 34, And Simeon blessed him and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall. Okay, first coming. Christ's first coming through, all the way through the tribulation. And, and that word and separates 2,000 years because he is also set for the rising again of many in Israel. That's his second coming all the way through the millennium. Uh, you could see likewise some other verse, verses, verse references we listed for you on your handout. Uh, but my main point is that between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and chapter 1 verse 2, the period between those two verses, the full stop, separates eternity from time. In other words, it contains a gap. Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Stop. Eternity stops. Time now begins. Because something takes place between verse 1 and verse 2, so that verse 2 goes on to say, and the earth was without form and void. Let me give you just seven reasons why there's a gap, why, why we know there's a gap right there. Because you can compare scripture with scripture, and this is just what, simply what you come up with. It's not my fault that the scholars don't do their homework and their Bible work. 
and their study work. Uh, that's not my fault. If somebody you know doesn't do their homework on this and they don't believe in the game, it's not my fault that a lot of creationists and even, you know, seven-day, 24-hour little literal creationists do not believe in a gap. That is not my fault. Because, number one, the emptiness demands it. Isaiah 45, 18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he hath created it, not in vain, not void, he formed it to be inhabited. I'm the Lord and there's none else. So God created it not in vain, but it was. It became without form and void. So number two, the language. <coughs> Excuse me, the language also demands it. Isaiah chapter 34, look at Isaiah chapter 34, verses 8 and 11. And you need to make note of these references at Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 because when you compare Scripture with Scripture, that same phrase without form and void is used here in Isaiah 38 and also used in Jeremiah 23. Watch, Isaiah 30, 30, excuse me, 34 verse 8, for it is a day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. What happens as a result of God bringing in a judgment? Verse 11, the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of, the line of without form and the stone, stones of void. It is the exact same Hebrew words translated differently. Line of confusion, stones of emptiness. Here. Here, this one's easier, Jeremiah 4, verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. And in both of those cross-referenced passages, the context is a destruction brought on by the judgment of God. It is called the day of the Lord's vengeance earlier in Isaiah 34, verse 8. Chapter 61, verses 2 and 3, Jeremiah 46, verse 10, Luke 21, verse 22. So, thirdly, the context demands it. The creation story is patterned on this Hebrew parallelism. And since it's uh, hard to see, I drew you a diagram of it basically on your handout so you can understand it. There's A and B and then A prime and B prime, which parallel A and B. So A, the world that then was, B, it's ruin. A prime, the heavens and earth, which are now, and B prime, it's blessing. And we gave you all the verse references there that, that refer to it. Fourthly, the darkness demands it. If Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 is a simple state of the raw state of God's original creation, then it contradicts other passages. Like 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 5. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have held of the word of life. Verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. That's what was from the beginning. Not the beginning of the earth, not the new beginning, but the beginning, beginning before time. Uh, uh, and in him is no darkness at all. So in the beginning, there was no darkness until something happened between those two verses and then it caused darkness. God's judgment caused darkness. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.16, speaking of God, says, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light. God dwells in light, not darkness. There would be no reason to separate light from darkness unless something happened between verse 1, verse 2. Psalm 104, verse 2, God covers himself with light. Who covereth, covereth thyself with light as with a garment. Uh, uh, fifth, the New Testament demands it. Romans 1, verse 20. The invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by looking at the things that are made. 
So Paul uses that passage to illustrate how God brings beauty and order to the darkness, confusion, and emptiness of our lives through the new birth. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Why did that have to happen? Because Adam's race was judged by a fall into sin. Therefore, God has to command light to shine out of the darkness. You know, sixthly, the evidence of sin in the universe demands it. Job 15, verse 15 says, Behold, God putteth no trust in his saints. So don't trust people. Trust God and love people. God putteth no, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Man's dominion was limited to the earth, and yet the whole heavens are unclean, including the stars. Job 25, 5, Behold, even the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. So when Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 says, darkness was on the face of the deep, that's not the deep blue sea uh, that's being referred to there, because see, the seas do not appear until verse 10. See, again, it's not my fault that somebody you know or you follow or you've heard preach or you've heard teach on creation doesn't do their homework. That's not my fault. Uh, The deep is the second heaven, the container of the universe. And, and, And what is there out beyond the 40, the, the 2 trillion observable galaxies, even beyond the 46 billion light years, beyond the cosmic background radiation surrounding their, the universe, what is there? Ask an astrophysicist and he'll say, well, I don't know. But if you look in the Bible, it tells you because according to the Bible, water surrounds us. Water is what surrounds us. Psalm 48, verse 4, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Not in our heaven, atmosphere, but above the heavens. Jeremiah 51, verses 15 and 16, He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he he causeth the vapors to ascend. So, So our universe, outer space, is is under water, and there be dragons there. So finally, the existence of the devil and his demons demand it. Uh, when and where did the devil come into existence? Well, if you look at Isaiah 14, you find out. Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 16, how art thou fallen from heaven? Meaning from the third heaven, cast out into our outer space. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, <clears throat> which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will send into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So clearly the nations in this context refers to how God orders his angelic beings. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will, five times Lucifer says I will. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? So those who deny a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 have no place. They have nowhere to put the fall of Lucifer. If there's not a gap there, where where are you going to put it? Has to occur before Genesis 3, when, when he shows up in the garden God planted eastward in Eden. Uh, Ezekiel 28, verses 15 and 16. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane 
out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So clearly, this, some of this had a near application to the king, king of Tyre uh, uh, in the historical context, but obviously, that is not, not really what's being talked about here, and God is taking that issue of King Attire and, you know, these other people, and he's taking that and he's saying, well, you know, really, what's happening in the Old Testament is simply a picture of spiritual truth and what happened in the heavens and what's happening invisibly. And so let me just speak to the devil through uh, the King Attire and, uh, you know, because you, uh, King Attire wasn't the covering chair, but somebody was, Lucifer was. And so all of this, you know, you learn a lot about, well, how did the angels fall into sin? What was it that, okay, well, you learn a lot right here in terms of the merchandise and the things, the things that went on. So number two, within the gap, the fall of Lucifer, seven letters, takes place, and he becomes Satan, five letters. I just thought I'd throw in that kind of biblical numerology there. God makes things perfect. His creatures mess it up. Watch, watch. Uh, uh, creation was perfect. Job 38, verses 4 to 7. Uh, where wast thou, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth, declared if thou hast understanding? Who hath laid the measures thereof, and knoweth? Or who has stretched the line upon it? I did. God, you know, it's rhetorical questions. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So creation was perfect. The universe was flooded as a result of Lucifer's fall into sin. So it was a universal flood. If you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, it talks about this flood, which has to be distinguished from the flood of Noah which was an earthly picture of the heavenly event. But 2 Peter 3, verse, beginning verse 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Th that statement's not even true. Because by the word of God, the heavens were of old, so, not the, not the heaven and earth we have now, but the one of Genesis 1-1. And the earth was standing out of water and in the water. Okay, so land appeared and yet we were Im immersed in the waters in the heavens, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Ungodly men. Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. So what was happening when God planted a garden on planet Earth uh, eastward in Eden, containing the tree of life. What was happening? Well, letter B, he was replenishing the kingdom. That was first assigned to Lucifer. He fell. All right, now it's commissioned to Adam. Adam was created in the image of God, according to verse 26 of Genesis 1. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Secondly, Adam is called the Son of God. He's not called a Son of God, but the Son of God in Luke 3, verse 38. In the, in the genealogy of Jesus, it says, which was uh, the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the Son of God. So pre-fall Adam was similar to post-resurrection Jesus. Uh, Adam was tempted in Eden... Jesus was tempted in a wilderness. Both were tested in a garden as to yielding their free will in order to follow God's will. 
in Adam's case, and this is letter C, he forfeited the kingdom through his fall in Genesis 3. So first, Adam died spiritually in that fall, Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of the tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That didn't happen. He didn't die physically the day he ate, but they died spiritually that day. So they, he died spiritually in the fall. Secondly, Adam's sons were all born not in God's image, but in his image. Watch. They, they were copies of the original, not the original. And, they, and we are all copies of copies of copies, which is why we don't live as long as they did. Uh, Genesis 5, verse 3, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Third, the kingdom of God is absent in the Old Testament because there are no subjects. Everybody fell, Adam fell spiritually. And, and, and therefore, life, spiritual life, eternal life, is not passed on from your parents. So there's, there's no sons of God on earth. And in the Old Testament, references to sons of God is either a reference to Jesus, Daniel 3.25, or a reference to angels, either elect angels, Job 1, verse 6, and chapter 2, verse 1, or evil angels, Genesis 6, verses 2 and 4. And um, references that you ought to take note of, other things about them that come into play as you get into prophecy in the second coming. Uh, number four, the Old Testament presents a physical manifestation of spiritual truth because everything is conducted in a physical kingdom until the first coming of Christ. When he breaks it all out of that mold and offers that spiritual along with the physical. But then John the Baptist warned them of that and tried to prepare them for it. Letter D, when Jesus Christ came the first time as the Son of God, he brought both kingdoms with him because he was the last Adam and the second man. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, and these are verses that you ought to take note of because it's it, the, wording, the words are the key to the Bible. So in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, it says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam, speaking of Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth earthy. Now, doesn't say the last man, but the second man is the Lord from heaven. So he is the second man because he starts a new race of humanity. There are only two races. Human and and born again, you know, sons of God and sons of Adam and the devil. Uh, uh, so there's only two races there are. But because Jesus started a new race, he's the second man, but he's the last Adam because this ain't never going to happen again. So both kingdoms were at hand during his earthly ministry. Mark 1, 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 1, 15, Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, so both kingdoms, bo what, what are now two separate kingdoms, were both on offer. We're on offered, were one kingdom and offered together. Uh, those two verses that we just looked at, the one from Mark and the other from Matthew, are the proof texts for people and scholars and preachers and others who do not do their Bible work like they should. They use these two verses as the proof text for saying that the two kingdoms are the same and kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are used synonymously and they overrun and they run over and they ignore all the other evidence that we've saw, seen from the Bible itself, from the verses we looked at tonight, or they say that the two terms are used to refer to connotative differences and not denotative differences. 
You know, scholars always have a way of getting around stuff and the plain teaching of the Bible. And they just, if you don't want to be a dispensationalist, if you don't want to rightly divide the Word of God, well, if you want to live in confusion all your life, okay, you'll, you know, you'll find a way to get around it. And uh, so they both just, they, they say that, look, both, both terms essentially just refer to God's rule. That's not correct. They were both at hand simultaneously because the king was right there. Uh, secondly, as the second man, last Adam, Jesus is the head of a new race in his own image. And that new race uh, will one day share his likeness, his own likeness. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 48 to 50. As, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. He's just echoing what Jesus said to Nicodemus. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, before we got saved, before we were born again, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. We don't go into our kingdom um, after the rapture in a corruptible body. Now, people can enter the kingdom of heaven in a corruptible body. Uh, you don't get into the kingdom of God in a corruptible body, but it, but it will be a kingdom that we will enter with a body like Christ. Romans 5, verses 12 to 21, especially verse 14, says, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the type, it's translated figure. He's the type. He's the ensample. He's, he's the... He's the imprint. He's the figure. He's the type of him that was to come. Clearly stating that Adam is a type of Christ in certain aspects. Uh, in the sense that through one man, sin passed on everybody. Then he's a type of Christ because through one man, being Christ, eternal life can be given to everybody. And so he goes down through that passage and he draws both some of the comparisons and some of the contrasts in the typology with Adam. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Letter E, Jesus, their Messiah, offered the kingdom of God to the Jews at his first coming, but they rejected it. Um, it was a legitimate offer. Uh, I mean, Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because remember, you have to, the only way to enter it for you is a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees. That's not something you have on your own. It has to be an imputed righteousness from Christ. Paul explains all that part later on. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not your righteousness by yourself works. But if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 12, verses 22 to 28. Then was brought unto Jesus one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this not the son of David? Because that miracle Jesus just did was itself a type or a picture of what he's willing to do with the nation of Israel. First off, it was stating that Israel's leaders are kind of demon-possessed. And because of that, they don't see things right and they don't know what to say. Now, that's the problem with a lot of counseling today. I'm just saying. Because so much of our therapeutic counseling is based on actually Buddhist ideas, and so we bring all of that in, and okay, well, fine. That is why you don't see things correctly, and you don't know what to tell people. But when the Pharisees heard it, since it was all about them, 
they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. I mean, they always have an answer. And it's always exact opposite to what the truth really is. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. <coughs> and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then, how shall then his kingdom stand? I mean, what you're saying makes no sense. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Luke 4, verses 42 to 44. And when it was day, Jesus departed and went into a desert place, and the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him. They stopped him that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. For therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come. See, first off, they don't even know what questions to ask. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall ye say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And that blew their minds. Letter I, the, because the Jews rejected him, the kingdom of God was given to the Gentiles by uniting them, uniting us as Christ's body. Matthew 21, verse 43. He, you know, even though it's the gospel of Matthew, even if, although it's the gospel of the Jews, Christ does his due diligence in preparing his apostles for the eventuality that was to come. So he's a proactive leader, and he prepares them for what's going to take place, even though he's giving them a legitimate offer of the kingdom at that time. He says in verse 43, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And if you think kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are synonymous, then you are right in saying the church usurps Israel, takes all their promises. God is not in, in, in any of this part of bringing Israel back to the land. <clears throat> that means nothing. The fact they've been preserved as a nation through 2,000 years, that means nothing. Uh, everything that's happening <clears throat> in the nation today or by way of prophecy, that means nothing. That's nothing for them. That is all for us. You know, all they are is Zionists. They are the ones who call themselves Jews and they're not. We, the church, we are the true Israel. Well, okay. Uh, but I think that the kingdom of God was taken from them, but the kingdom of heaven was not. And the kingdom of God was, was taken from them and given to the nations to bring forth spiritual fruit, the fruit thereof, which means subjects for the kingdom. Kingdom of heaven kind of stayed with it, went into mystery form, but stays with Israel. So there is, there was a, a nation of Jews to whom belonged the kingdom. But Jesus follows through on this word in Matthew 21, 43, and gives the kingdom of God to Gentiles. So this time the kingdom of God remains on earth in the church as the body of Christ after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And that is why Paul never mentions kingdom of heaven. Paul never uses the phrase son of man. Um, Paul's subject is the kingdom of God. Acts 8 verse 12, but when they believed, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Acts 19, verse 8, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And all the skeptical scholars say the term kingdom of heaven only occurs in Matthew because it was a rhetorical 
device. It was a linguistic accommodation to the Jews because in those times, the Jews used the phrase kingdom of heaven to refer to the kingdom of God because they didn't want to get close to saying the name of the Lord in vain. And yet Paul, who was a Pharisee, as a matter of fact, Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a rabbi trained by Gamaliel himself. And yet, like here in Acts chapter 19, verse 8, when he walks into a synagogue, he still doesn't use the term kingdom of heaven. He uses the term kingdom of God, and he's a Jew. So clearly that argument that, well, it was just a rhetorical device and Linguistic accommodation is false, but that is the type of reasoning you'll find in scholarly, so-called scholarly papers about kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. Uh, so, Acts 20, verse 25, And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Acts 28, verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, and he's talking about the Jews in Rome, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning until evening. And if there was any moment he was going to use that phrase kingdom of heaven just, to, just so he didn't offend. And, and you know, it, yeah, it would have been there. Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him, Jews and Gentiles, and apparently even some who were of the household of Caesar, meaning Nero, I think even his, even his Nero's wife, who he later kills, I think, I think he did that because she became a Christian. That's just what I think. But verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. The king is the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The subjects are the sons of God by the new birth, the church. 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3 say, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. John 1, verses 12 and 13, watch. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And that's a specific term from, lifted from the Old Testament that refers to a specific thing. And uh, so finally, uh, that was God's eternal purpose all along. Ephesians 3, verses 10, 11, and 21 to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord unto, number one, him be glory, number two, in the church, number three, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. And our time is up. But we are exactly halfway through. And this week and two weeks from now on Wednesday night are the mind blow. These are the mind blow weeks. These are the weeks of getting your mind blown, um, uh, particularly next, uh, next time as we finish up uh, looking at the kingdom of heaven and then tying all the loose ends together at the end. Um, th this is needed stuff. So let's go ahead and uh, stand and bump elbows with your neighbor. Father, we thank you tonight for uh, this opportunity. We thank you for the chance that we have to step into your presence through the word of God. Simply look at it verse, verse by verse, putting things together, just like you've told us to do in Isaiah 28, a little here and a little there, line upon line, precept upon precept, uh, little by little, bit by bit. And, and then the picture starts to become clear and all the false teaching is shown up for what it is so that we don't fall into it and we can keep others from falling into it. 
That is so needed today. So, Father, I pray you'd help us over these weeks together as in this Discipleship 2 class, we get, get those things that will make us strong in the faith and sound doctrine that will glorify you. We ask it in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen.